Okay, so this was by far and away the most difficult talk I've ever written, or at least in the recent past. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Chris Lintar, I'm the PI of Zooniverse, and as a result, what I normally do is take slides from most of the people in the room um, and then turn them into a talk that makes me look good. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't work um, when they're sitting in the room. Um, so what I want to do is just, uh, and, and I know looking around uh, the room, the locals I see, I think, have heard most of my jokes before from the seminar I gave a few months ago. So what I really want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just trying to set up what we want to try and do this week and what I think the problems um, that we're going to try and tackle are. Um, <clears throat> we're at an interesting point, um, I think, for Zooniverse. We've just crossed 1 million registered users, which is uh, very exciting. And, and so I, I feel the pressure more than ever to make sure that um, when these million people spend their spare time on our site, um, that we make sure that they're doing something useful. And that means turning their classifications into useful science, um, which means essentially publishing papers. Um, and so that's the goal of the week, is to try and make that process easier and to get a better understanding of what we need to do to do that. And it's about time that we did that. I was thinking about this on the way over. Um, <coughs> citizen science in astronomy is now uh, nearly 15 years old. So the first serious attempt at this was, I think, uh, NASA click workers. Uh, this is what the site looked like back in 2001. So this is uh, about a year into their project. Um, and this was using old, uh, mostly Viking images of Mars, although also some, some newer stuff. Um, to do crater classification. This is a task that we've attacked with MoonZoo. Um, and click workers um, showed, first of all, that there were lots of people who would spend their time doing this. They got a ridiculous amount of attention. Um, but it also demonstrated that that critical task of turning attention into science is much harder um, than perhaps you'd like it to be. So click workers, um, which was a sort of was only ever built as a demonstration site, got as far as taking a rough average of all of the, the crater classifications they received, and they managed to reproduce um, scientific results of the accuracy that, were, that was already available from automatic routines. So there is a click workers paper. Um, it's interesting. It, it talks mostly about the fact that lots of people will do this stuff, um, but it doesn't produce novel scientific results. Uh, and so 15 years on, um, we really need to be at the point where we know that when we launch a project, we can produce useful results. Of course, it helps if your project is simpler. Um, and I wanted to show particularly the original Galaxy Zoo, so this is 2007. Um, it's looking rather like a ring galaxy on this projector, but that was supposed to be a very boring elliptical. Um, and Galaxy Zoo was, I think, um, the simplest citizen science task you can imagine working. It had um, six buttons, um, and that was it. So it's just click a button, tell us what happens, tell, tell us what shape the galaxy was. And so this, in some sense, was a much simpler task than, than putting craters onto, onto a map. It was much easier to understand what consensus might be like. Uh, we'll hear about the science that's come from it from Karen uh, a bit later. Um, but this was, I, th I think we got away with, with this project we certainly didn't realize we were going to get deep into data analysis with it. But we got away with it because the basic task was very simple, because um, you had these six buttons. Um, of course, I, I've already said several times that there's lots of attention uh, out there. I've already mentioned that we have a million volunteers on the Zooniverse. And most of that million have done astronomy projects, by the way. Uh, I looked this up last night, and Stuart will probably have a different number. But it's more than three quarters of those people have taken part in the astronomical project. So while it's fun to run projects that look at the Serengeti, at Plankton, at Wales, uh, at cancer cells and so on, the core of our volunteers care about astronomy. Um, and you can see that Zooniverse is continuing to, to attract attention. And I like this plot, or these plots, because you can make two completely different points using the same data, which as an astronomer makes me very confident and happy. Um, so this is time in the Zooniverse, in weeks, versus uh, in blue, you've got the number of sign-ups, and in red, you've got the cumulative strength of the Zooniverse army. 
Um, and so if you look at the red line, the cumulative plot, what you see is a more or less constant increase in um, volunteers. There are little spikes here and here, uh, but basically the number of people we have available who, who are at least getting our emails uh, increases steadily over time. And that's what you'd expect if traffic is being driven by social media, by people talking to each other, by people saying, hey, I found a planet, or I just looked at Mars, or, or have you seen this galaxy that looks like a penguin, or whatever. Um, and so you have this nice cumulative traffic regardless of anything else we do. But then when you look at the blue picture, which is the individual signups, those spikes are all uh, event-driven, and they're generally driven by times when we've got press. So, for example, these big things here, here, and here, this is the Brian Cox effect. Uh, these are, we ran a big collaboration with the BBC every January um, in which, on primetime television, everyone's favorite particle physicist says, uh, go to the site, help us discover a planet, or, or look at Mars, or uh, discover a lens galaxy. Uh, and lots of the other spikes are project launches or times when we've got press. So in blue, the story is that it's the old media that's driving traffic. But whatever's going on, we still have lots and lots of people and lots and lots of attention, which is exactly how it, how it should be. And that attention is mostly concentrated in the places that were easy and obvious for us to reach from Oxford. So uh, this is a map of where our million volunteers are and produced uh, by the Zunivers team, and you see, you can see we, we, we trace population density in Europe pretty well, we sort of oversampled in England. Um, the US looks pretty familiar, um, but we're not great at the rest of the world yet. Um, and that's something that we want to fix. So we're looking, we actually have somebody starting work today uh, in Oxford whose job it is to look at how we can change our infrastructure. And one of the things we want to do is make the infrastructure work better for people on this side of the world. Um, but, of course, we've also got the efforts of people locally um, who have translated many of our sites. I'm very excited uh, about this idea of Zooniverse not just being uh, an Anglophone, not just an English-speaking place, um, but uh, an in properly international one. Um, I should say, by the way, for it, it, one of the things I, I think it will be interesting to look at, probably not in this workshop, but I really, really want to look at the places where there are differences in classification between people speaking different languages. Um, it, I, I think it would be interesting sociology, um, but what the, you can also make scientific arguments that there, there'd be changes. There's the, yeah, the slides, but those of you who've heard me speak before know about the anomaly uh, where we thought we'd found more anti-clockwise than clockwise galaxies in Galaxy Zoo, um, which is a result that doesn't make any sense. And one of the suggestions for that is that it's to do with the fact that most of our classifiers read left to right, and so their eyes would hit the spiral arms in a particular way. So you may predict that that would be opposite for uh, galaxies in different languages. Um, and so, but, but anyway, the message is that, that we have plenty of users. And what that's supposed to show <laughs> is that it's interesting, when I, when I give talks about Zooniverse, at this point when I've talked about millions of users or, or hundreds of millions of classifications, uh, people, that's the point where people are impressed. And that's not the point that you should be excited or impressed. Because you need the next step. You need to, show, you need to fact know that those people taken together actually produce useful science, can produce a consensus result that's meaningful. And this is supposed to show, this has obviously got screwed up in the transfer to Meg's laptop, um, but this is supposed to show the beautiful results of Galaxy Zoo 1 that let us split our galaxies into this different type. So think of this as a, a, as a representation of scientific success. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually pretty good as a representation of yeah, They say all good scientific projects produce more questions than they do answers. And I, I, think, I think we've achieved that there. The amount of effort that we can summon up is also rather scary. So I've already mentioned the Brian Cox collaboration, and Phil Marshall will hopefully be here later to talk about this. But with spacewalks, so our search for gravitational lenses, um, in two days after um, saying on the BBC, please come and help us, we reached uh, three and a three and a half, uh, seven and a half million classifications, um, which is a ridiculous amount to be, be done in two days. 
Um, it, it's a rate of traffic we hadn't seen since the original Galaxy Zoo. But what I wanted to say to you guys was that actually this wasn't done by a huge number of people. I mean, 50,000 people is great, but if you divide one by the other, you find that people are really coming back and really engaging with these projects. And so that gives us our leverage that we can use this week. Because when you've only got 50,000 people um, doing this many classifications, you know a lot about each person. If we make the leap to understanding that every time anyone classifies an image, they tell us not only about the thing that they're classifying, but also about the image itself. Sorry, also about themselves. Um, then in 250 classifications per person, you have a lot of information about each of these volunteers. That's what allows us to go beyond the simple thing of just taking a, a, a weighted, an, an average or a loosely weighted average across all of the classifications. We actually know a lot about people's behavior. Um, we also know a lot about people's behavior across, across projects, of course. But because we have that extra information, we're able to um, do better than just trusting a sort of blind vote, um, a democracy. We, we can begin to listen to people in the crowd whose voices are more interesting on particular topics. And of course, when you do that, that works very well. This is uh, our fabulous discovery from, from Stargazing Life. This is uh, a lens. Um, we may or may not be calling it Stitch 1. It's a, a long story. So what you're seeing here, this is an infrared image of this galaxy's a uh, redshift of about 0.2. The red arc here is uh, a lens galaxy at a redshift of about 2.3. Um, and what's fascinating about this thing is that we managed to get radio uh, interferometry data of it. Um, for those who, who don't know, Stargazing Live, the program we work with, is based at Jodrell Bank, a big uh, radio observatory. Uh, and we were sitting there thinking, we just found this, it was day two, and we sat in the control room saying, well, what we really need is, a, is some radio data. And all of us sort of looked out the window at the Lovell telescope, which was sitting there, and thought, well, okay, we can use that. We had to, and the, the team at Jodrell gave us time. They had to filter out the BBC's broadcasts because we were doing live television from the observatory while we were observing. Uh, but luckily, that's a defined frequency. Uh, and the radio image of this, I don't have it on the slide deck, but um, it's just an arc here. And there's one other source like this now where in the infrared you have a complete ring, so a proper Einstein ring uh, lens, but in the radio uh, you only see, it, see an arc. And the interpretation of that, we think, from the modeling, um, is that the two are coming from slightly different sources. So the radio is from an AGM, but the infrared is for, distributed through the galaxy. And so the modeling is sensitive. And I, maybe this is obvious if you work on strong lensing, but I just thought that it was amazing that the AGN is offset enough um, to, to break the ring. Um, and so this is great, and, and this is an excellent success story. So this, you know, we promoted the project. We got 7.5 million classifications. We found this object, um, and then we followed it up, and we got these exciting scientific results that I think you'll hear more about from Phil. However, there's a hidden secret behind this, which is that this candidate was identified first, not by, by processing the classifications, but by a discussion uh, between the team and on talk on the discussion tool. And that's been true almost every time we've tried to do anything quickly. It's true for planet hunters, as you'll hear from Meg. It's true for some of the weird and wonderful stuff in Galaxy Zoo. Um, it's true um, for Ancient Lives, our papyri project. Uh, where they're publishing, a, there's a whole book uh, coming out this year of interesting papyri that have been recovered from the Ancient Lives project, but they're all from discussion and from talk. And so to me, this, this is obviously a huge success for the Zooniverse. We found this interesting, very distant radio uh, galaxy, which is Lens. It's great. Um, but it's also a sign of our failure to get our act together in terms of being able to process data. Now, there are a couple of challenges that stopped us doing this properly for, for stargazing. One is the scientific one of understanding how to combine classifications properly. Um, and, and we'll hear probably we'll hear more from Phil about uh, exactly how they've attempted to do that. The second one is, of course, technological. And as Stuart will tell you, and receiving 7.5 million classifications in two days isn't easy either. Um, and it may be that we never solve this problem, but um, you know, we, we were at the point where downloading the data 
was slower than the rate in which it was coming in. Um, and, and so there's a technological step. And those two things are in tension. Um, the, the more we think about this stuff, the more one is tempted to build more and more complex routines for data analysis, um, to do a better job of waiting, to um, think more carefully about the many different combinations of classifier and classified objects that one can put together. Um, Edwin, who we'll hear from later, has you know, gone as far as using MCMC to model the uh, possible combinations of those things. But the more complicated your data analysis gets, the harder it is for us to deploy uh, routinely. And the less transparent it is for the scientific user at the end. Uh, and I think one of the things I, I want to talk about this week with many of you is how to, to manage that balance, how to um, make sure we get the best out of the citizen science data while still producing results that are trustable by people who haven't spent a week working on pseudomist data analysis. And I think there's a conversation to be had about balancing those two things. But we have to get it right. We have to get this right because we can already see um, that we're going to need to. So um, this is my, I always like to put the LSST into, into presentations. But the LSST um, is there as a representative of future surveys. Uh, as the locals in the room will know, there's plenty of, of things happening that will need citizen science. The LSST data rate is enormous, 30 terabytes a night, 250,000-ish alerts uh, of variability or of change. Um, and I'm utterly convinced that 90 to 95 to 99% of that data will not need humans to do anything with it. But even 1% of that data stream is enormous. There's also a good sense that we're going to need to analyze that data rapidly. Most of what's interesting in terms of citizen science for LSST, whether it's looking for active asteroids or whether it's looking for um, supernovae or whether it's looking for uh, AGN, it is to do with time domain astrophysics. Uh, and so we need reliable data analysis routines that run at least nightly on data coming off the back of LSST. Uh, and which produce results that are immediately trusted and understood because they trigger follow-up. Um, and so dealing with this, this data stream requires um, a proper tested, calibrated method of data analysis. The, the current method of um, somebody in this room having some spare time at some point to knock together a code, while fun, isn't going to cope with what's coming our way. Uh, and so we, we've had our fun. We need, to, we need to get serious about this, I'm afraid. Uh, and that's true if you look beyond LSST. So that's my LSST is real slide. That's the top of the mountain being leveled for the building that will house LSST. So this is my, this really is coming, reminder. Um, but as we get to this, this is, this is supposed to be a picture of the SKA which is, again, rather appropriate. <laughs> so this is what SKA currently looks like. Um, but, but, yeah, if LSST's data rates are terrifying, SKA, of course, is, a, is several orders of magnitude larger. Um, again, the proportion of SKA data that will need analysis by humans is probably um, much less than 1%, but it's not zero. And with Radio Galaxy Zoo, which some of you will have seen, we already have a project that's investigating the ways that um, we might take radio data and, and combine it um, mm -hmm. with human classification. In Radio Galaxy Zoo, the task is to combine um, large radio surveys with, near, uh, with, with optical or infrared surveys and do source matching, um, which sounds like, before I got into this, sounds like it should be utterly trivial. Um, to write an automatic routine and say, yeah, this radio source matches this infrared source. But because of the differing morphologies of the two uh, types of, uh, of image, um, that actually turns out it's still something where humans outperform computers. And we need to fix that rapidly. And again, at SKA, which won't necessarily store most of its data and make on-the-fly decisions about what's being kept, 
um, they have to do that because of the size of the data sets, um, will need rapid analysis. It's another spur to, to getting this stuff right. Luckily, we have a lot of information we can use to try and develop the kind of generalized routines I've been arguing that we need. So this is nothing to do with data analysis. This is a snapshot of the Zooniverse uh, from a, this is a few weeks ago. So this is, I think we're calling this the Simpson diagram after Rob. Uh, but this is the time on site and the number of visitors. So this is sort of a measure of popular, popularity in the Zooniverse. You want to be in the top right uh, projects. So Operation War Diary, World War I history project was new. And so this is where we expect their projects over time tend to move down to the right. Um, as, as, you, as time goes on, you become less popular with new people, get less publicity, you're off one of those blue spikes, um, but the people you do have are really committed to your cause. And there's almost a main sequence evolving. And we've argued about whether this is genuine or not. Uh, these are the failure projects. There's no astronomy down here. You know, yeah. astronomy is very popular. Sorry? A uh, number of users over time, I think. Uh, color is um, domain. Yeah, exactly. The point is not to make you care about this diagram. It, there's an animated version, but as soon as I show that, everyone in the room starts coming up with their own theories about exactly what's going on, and that's not the problem for this week. Um, the point is that each dot here is uh, a drop in citizen science space. So each one of these projects has properties that we can use to test uh, our data analysis. So I was thinking about just the types of comparison we can make, the types of differences between projects. So the one that everyone always thinks of is obviously we've got different types of project. We've got the galaxy zoom decision tree. Is this a spiral galaxy? Is this a bulge? Um, we've got a marking, marking project like the Milky Way project. Please draw where you see uh, a bubble associated with star formation. Uh, and we have some comparison projects. Which of these two images is more cratered, for example? The, the divisions aren't quite as clear cut as that. Um, I think you could certainly think of one can reduce a marking task to a question task. So another way to look at the Milky Way project, instead of you throw out some of the data, is a one line decision tree that just says, is there a bubble in this image? We've done that on Planet Hunters as well, where What's a, a marking task? Is there a transit here? Uh, can also be interpreted as an answer to the question, is there a transit here? But nevertheless, there are different types of projects, and we'll have to think about that. I think there's a fundamental difference between classification and discovery projects. So uh, Galaxy Zoo says, there is a galaxy in this image. Tell me about it. Space Warp says, is there a lens here? Planet Hunter says, is there a transit here? And so I think there's a big difference between those two. Uh, for starters, there's a, you know, we have th this idea of, um, of discovery somehow feels fundamentally different to me. Um, I think that's something to be discussed. Uh, I think there's a big difference in whether we're looking for something rare, got sparse versus, versus rare. But I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, common versus rare. So um, in Snapshot Serengeti, uh, if you think of that as a wildebeest discovery project, then about a third of the images in some seasons have wildebeest in. So, uh, you know, the tech, yes, there's a wildebeest, yes, there's a wildebeest, no wildebeest, no wildebeest, yes, there's a wildebeest. Planet Hunters, the answer is almost always no. You have a very strong prior for a given light curve. Is there a transit in this light curve? The answer is almost certainly no. Um, it seems to me that the data reduction strategies that we use are going to be different for those two cases. That we're going to pay attention to people differently. Um, we're going to weight people differently. We're going to um, take people's answers in a different way. For example, you might, for a rare classification, the information you get from somebody asserting that they found something, the balance between what that tells you about the target and what that tells you about themselves is going to be different. And so one of the things I want out this week is a sense of which strategies work in both of these cases. So that we can then, when we get a new project, when we get, I don't know, um, leaf comparison zoo or uh, 
radio moves you or whatever it is, um, we can, those aren't real projects, um, we can we, we can say, okay, so this is a, a, a target where we're looking, it's a discovery project and we're looking for something rare, so you should use SWARM 3 as a strategy or whatever. And the same is true for, for gold standard data. Um, so gold standard data is the term I use for sort of the known results. So these are either expert classifications. In the case of Galaxy Zoo, we had Kevin's 50,000 classifications, for example. There are other papers where people have looked at 10 or 20,000 galaxies. Um, or it could be simulated data, as in the case of Planet Hunters uh, and Space Warps. And so uh, for some projects, we get to choose how much expert data we have. If we're using simulations on Planet Hunters, if I need more expert data, I can just put more in. I can get more people to see. In Galaxy Zoo, if I wanted to, I could make sure everyone's first 50,000 galaxies were the same 50,000 that Kevin looked at. Um, so I'd like a, a workable answer to the question, how many simulations should I make people see, and in which circumstances. In other projects, we just have what we've got. You know, if, if we're relying on expert data, and the experts have only looked at a few thousand images, uh, Planet 4, for example, where we've relied on already overworked people to provide expert data, um, then that might change the data analysis technique you use. So how do I balance? Yeah, what, what decisions do I make depending on what expert data I have? There's also a trade-off in what outcomes you want. So in some projects, let's say, um, let's say a project that's going to trigger Subaru follow-up of uh, type 1A supernova or something, there you, you probably want high fidelity. You want everything that comes out as being classified as a target follow-up to be real. And you may not care that you miss a lot of the other possibles. Whereas if you're doing a statistical survey of supernova properties over a long time and you're not going to follow most of them up, then you probably want to ignore fidelity and choose accuracy. So you want the top 20% classified as a supernova to be uh, as complete as possible. And so we have this trade-off between the two, which we won't be able to get away with, from, but which is a function both of the raw data of the classification behavior and of the data analysis technique we use. Yeah. Yeah, we have. We've done for. I'm using. So we had a supernova project, uh, which triggered its own follow-up. Um, no, no, no. It, it triggered um, follow-up on larger telescopes, uh, which gave us ground truth in retrospect. So Edwin, I suspect, will be able to talk about your supernova stuff. Right. But yeah. So more on that later. Um, there's also, and then there's then there are properties of the projects themselves. So there are. In the Zooverse, I was thinking about trying to categorize all of these. And we might do this in the pub later, because I'd like to know what people think. But there are easy projects, and there are hard projects in the Zooverse. Now, I love all of your projects equally. Um, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. But I don't know if you've seen Sunspotter, which we launched this week. So Sunspotter is a brilliant project. Um, with solar dynamic observatory data. And the question is, which of these sunspot regions, these are magnetic maps, I think? Or are these just visible light images? Which did we go for in the end? Anyway, these are images of sunspot regions um, drawn from sun. And the only question they care about is, which is more complex? And it takes less than a second to do a classification on this project. You just sit there and you click and you click and click. It's brilliant on an iPad. If you're bored during the next week, this is highly recommended. Uh, you could just say, that's right. So this, I think, is an easy project. Um, there's a shared understanding amongst everyone in the room already. You haven't thought about this project before this morning. You know what I mean by which is more complex, and you get you can answer that. Um, other projects, and talking about it this morning, Galaxy Zoo, new Galaxy Zoo, is, I think, a more complicated and more, uh, more difficult project. See, I abuse my own project in order not to offend anyone. But how prominent is the central bulge compared with the rest of the galaxy? Take some thinking about it. It's not an instantly understandable thing. And those in the room who translated Galaxy Zoo uh, will know that choice of language matters here. 
uh, we ended up with a, a fascinating discussion on the meaning of the word compi. Um, and and so, 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 so we have easy and hard projects, and I suspect there are generic user behaviors that come out when you look at easy versus hard projects. So uh, we have, as you'll hear, in many projects, assigned a weight to the users. But this distribution is a function of what users we have, but also how easy or hard the task is. Uh, and again, in space warps, as you'll hear, you get a similar mix. And then finally, I think we're always going to have popular projects. And again, I love all your projects equally. But we are, some projects are going to be popular and attract hundreds of thousands of people. I don't think we understand which projects those are. Uh, if anyone had asked me whether Planet Hunters was one of those projects, I would have thought you were crazy. Uh, and yet, here we are in, in a project where people love looking at graphs, um, as long as they can just see the planet. We're also always going to have niche projects. The Supernova project we ran, a few of the others had a few thousand really dedicated classifiers. And so that translates into projects in which we know a lot about the users, because it's a niche project and the, the users hang around for a long time. This is a popular project where there's a continual influx of new people. We're never going to know very much about those people. And again, that changes your strategy. So my aim for the week, my aim for you for the week, um, is to get us to the point where we benchmark, we understand the variety of options available to us to attack this fundamental question of turning Zooniverse data into scientific knowledge, and that we have some sense as we move around in this space of how our choices change uh, and, and how our strategy should change. In return, my plan for the next year is to ingest all of that information into the Zooniverse um, and to get to the point where what you're receiving from us in near real time is not a raw database dump of classifications, but is actually a first guess at the consensus result. Um, and that will help you guys. Uh, and it will help everyone who comes after you to build new projects. So um, apologies for the slightly rambling talk. It's very difficult when everyone in the room is more of an expert than you. Um, but I look forward very much to the next week. Thanks. Do you have some questions? Or you have yeah. I, I think I finished with enough time for questions if there are any. Yeah. Have you ever given thought of the yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so far, we don't see any evidence of that happening. So, so far, when we get a popular new project, the other projects get more, get a boost in traffic. So, Planet 4, as you know, um, benefited greatly from this year's stargazing project because people remembered it existed. Um, as we get to a point in the Zooniverse where we have hundreds or thousands of projects, then I think it's a question of which projects are promoted, so which end up on the home page and, and so on. But we have thoughts about that. Um, the one thing I'll say about that now is I think what that does is it creates an incentive for the scientists on a particular project to engage with their community. At the minute, it, none of you do this, but it's possible to take the Zooniverse community for granted. Because we'll send an email and we'll get traffic and people will turn up and do your project. I think we'll get to a point where if there is competition, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it will favor those who actually put some effort into producing results and to, and to doing, engaging with their community. Any other questions? Yeah. One more. I have a question. So what about logging? You talk, do you think there's a difference between non-logged in and logged in? And is that something more like design? No, you're right. I, I, yeah. And should we be treating those people differently? Um, yeah. So we don't. And, you know, how they transition. Is there some difference before they log in versus after? Is that no, you're right. That should have been on the list. So early projects, we insisted everyone logged in so that um, we could keep track of people. And because we want to encourage people to take part, we've shifted to a mode in which you can take part. In most projects, we can take part without being logged in. And you'll get hassled uh, politely uh, as, you, as you go forward. But even I think there's, a, there's, there's almost two cases. People who come and do five classifications and then either log in or never come back, I'm, I'm sort of OK lumping all of those together. In the absence of any other knowledge, I think people who just turn up and do a few are, are roughly all the same user. I don't think we have enough information to distinguish them. But there are, in many of the projects, people who, despite our hassling, do many, many, many classifications without ever logging in. 
uh, we have some sense of who they are because of the IP address. Um, and so, so we can disentangle that. Uh, yeah, you're right, but that's another difference. The, my list of differences wasn't exhaustive. Um, it was exhausting, uh, but not exhaustive. Uh, and I'm sure we'll find others as the week goes on. Yeah. Yeah, in mo well, no, it definitely matters. So in most cases, we're comparing to expert data. So in most cases, we'll have a small number of images that have been sorted by experts, uh, and, and that's that's critical. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of images that people classify like. Yeah. Uh, you do you take a few like randomly chosen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In most cases, it, uh, in other cases, we'll we'll look for simulated data.